this was very much Silicon Valley, but Intel took it to the nth degree. The idea that you might be worth a billion dollars, you may have been hired last week, but you're all the same. You're all an engineer. Hi. Good morning. How, How you are doing? you? Oh, pretty well. How are you doing? Good, good. Noyce wanted Intel to be run more like a very large lab team than a hierarchy. He actively encouraged staff to pursue their own ideas. And in one particular case, this would trigger the most important invention in the industry since the integrated circuit. This was the microprocessor, a programmable integrated circuit that would become the brain of all modern computers. The idea for the microprocessor came from Ted Hoff, an Intel engineer. Intel was developing a set of chips for a Japanese calculator firm, but Hoff decided that the existing plans were far too complicated. If you look at a calculator and you think about the various parts of it, it would take electronic systems to run the printer, electronic systems to scan the keyboard. All of this was to be done with special integrated circuits that added to the complexity of the calculator. Hoff proposed building a single master integrated circuit that could be programmed to perform several different functions, not just calculations. In other words, a computer on a chip. But the Japanese engineers weren't convinced that this was feasible. So Hoff went to Noyce instead. I told him about the concerns about the uh, engineers and so on. He said, continue to pursue it. So he was very encouraging to take a bolder step and not be quite so willing to let the customer decide every aspect of, of the design. Intel persuaded the Japanese firm to back Hoff's proposal. A young Italian chip designer, Federico Fagin, turned the idea into a working model. Reluctant just to hand over all the rights to the device, Intel renegotiated the Japanese deal. In 1971, they launched the chip, the 4004, as the first commercially available microprocessor. Well, this is the uh, Intel 4004, the, the world's first microprocessor. Uh, it is packaged in a 16-pin package, uh, and basically it replaces uh, uh, about uh, uh, several thousand discrete components that were used before, or tens of integrated circuits, uh, and it performed the function, which uh, for the day was quite, quite fast. Here's a... Here's a display of the first microprocessor, what the chip looked like. Of course, it was a lot smaller than that. And this is the calculator that it was to be used in, one of several different designs. And it shows a circuit board. And you can see the microprocessor is the package that has sort of the gold lid on it. This was our first ad, which was 1971, announcing a new era of integrated electronics. And uh, this was actually, I believe, a full, like, double page ad. Although the sales grew slowly because it takes time to design it in and so on and to create uh, new products and have enough volume to, to feed a factory, uh, the, the movement was, uh, was irreversible and, uh, uh, and, and industry, a real industry was created. Noyce now hit the road. Like a traveling preacher, he evangelized on behalf of the new device. He wasn't trying to create a personal computer industry, which was still several years away. Instead, Noyce promoted the microprocessor as a far more general purpose technology. My dad used to draw the analogy of the, uh, the fractional horsepower motor, where Originally, electric motors were things you had in a factory that ran all the belts, that ran the, the sanding machines and the cutting machines. But eventually, when smaller motors were made, they could be put into vacuum cleaners and washing machines and coffee grinders and all kinds of things that really were not envisioned back when the electric motor was invented. Noyce's vision was that the microprocessor could be used to put simple intelligence into everyday devices, from elevators to petrol pumps. 
what became known as embedded control. And as far as I know, the embedded control applications probably represent something like an order of magnitude. More processors go into that area than go into desktop and notebook computers. Just about two weeks ago, I went in to get my third pacemaker, <laughs> in other words, so still healing up from the incision, but that has a microprocessor in it, and when I go see the doctor, he puts a device on it, and it reads out, tells out all sorts of information about what my heart's been doing, and uh, you know, that way he can see if there's any warning signs and any additional steps have to be done. Noyce might not have directly invented the memory chip or the microprocessor, but he was certainly their godfather. To all outward appearances, Noyce looked to be riding high, but those closest to him knew that the picture was deceptive. In one crucial area, his marriage to Betty, Noyce had been struggling for years. Unhappy in California, Betty was spending increasing time in her native New England. Noyce, meanwhile, was not always faithful. My father thought that the divorce, when it came, was really a failure, and that he felt very, uh, he felt very bad for a couple of years. He was the only person in his family to ever go through a divorce. Noyce's unhappiness was compounded by the layoff of a third of Intel's employees in 1974, the result of a downturn in the global economy following the oil crisis the previous year. I can recall walking into Bob's office um, and um, he was uh, looking down at his desk and he was quite unhappy. He said, uh, I don't see why we have to negatively affect people's lives for a few cents to give to Wall Street, if you will. The company, even before the layoffs, was too big for Bob's comfort zone. There were too many issues of growth, organization, infighting, the same kind of thing that made him miserable as Fairchild. Noyce decided to re-examine his role at Intel and step back from some of his day-to-day -day responsibilities. Noyce lost his direction for a while in the mid-1970s. So much of what had defined him to himself was in flux. But this period of directionlessness would not last long. Noyce was about to take on some remarkable new roles that would define the remainder of his life and the future of Silicon Valley. On Thanksgiving Day 1975, Noyce remarried to Intel's personnel director, Ann Bowers. Bob and I talked about what he was going to do next a lot. He felt that his chief contribution was not technical anymore, but was giving back uh, in terms of helping promising entrepreneurs that he, he thought had really good ideas to, to go forward. Noyce's most significant relationship by far with a young entrepreneur began in 1977 when he was introduced to a 22-year-old named Steve Jobs, co-founder of a small computer manufacturing company called Apple. Steve was a very compelling young person. He had a big vision. He was very determined. As a person, he intrigued Bob, less than his actual technology at that point. He just sort of started showing up at our house on his motorcycle usually and so then there would be these extended conversations because I'd feed him and they'd talk and we took him on some vacations with us. He was fun to have around if, if sometimes a little difficult because he would, um, he had expectations that people would help him in ways they couldn't always fulfill. We had a, a dinner here back in the 70s with uh, Governor Jerry Brown, and quite a few members of the industry were here, and Steve was here with Bob. You know, Bob Noyce just took the lead, almost automatically, because he would ask penetrating questions.